Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is another installment of our Stanford Silicon Valley New Japan Project Public Forum Series. And today, uh, we get to do one of the fun things at a university, which is take a lot of the existing literature out there and synthesize it and present it to the general public and also present some of our new research. In this case, that's done by uh, our very own uh, Kaneta Kamaki. So the provocative title of Understanding Silicon Valley and Startup Ecosystems, New Research and Academic Classics You Should Know. Because over the years, everybody keeps coming to Silicon Valley and then they keep trying to figure out how the ecosystem works. And it turns out there are a lot of books that have already been written that go through a lot of the things that people rediscover and over and over. So one of the purposes of this session, which will be recorded so you can see it again at some point, is, and we will uh, circulate the slides because they will have a lot of uh, summaries on them, is to just provide a basis of information that everybody can refer to as a starting point, and then move beyond there to do your own research, your own discoveries, and your own whatever activities you're doing. I'm Kenji Kashida. I'm a research associate here at the Japan program, and I'm leading the Stanford Silicon Valley New Japan project. So first, a couple words about the project. Uh, it, this is a platform to link Stanford, Silicon Valley, and Japan, the most exciting parts of Japan, and how to harness Silicon Valley. Uh, and it's, uh, this project is a joint, uh, is jointly orchestrated by <coughs> the uh, Stanford Japan program here at Shorenstein A Park and the US Asia Technology Management Center in the School of Engineering. Our main activities are a public forum series with networking like this one, uh, research and publication, policy analysis and implementation studies, and a variety of study groups with international uh, and uh, other collaborators like UC Berkeley, European Commission. Commission and a Keio University, and a variety of outreach activities. Thanks to those of you who joined our, <coughs> uh, we hosted a US-Japan Venture Capital Conference that had about 700 attendees uh, overall last month, and we'll be doing a series of other outreach activities whenever the opportunity arises. We'd like to say thank you for our sponsors, which make our activities possible. We have at the diamond level, Kozo Keikaku Engineering, Platinum, Komatsu, Gold, World Innovation Lab, Will, and uh, silver sponsors, NEDO, the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, which is a branch of the Japanese government, uh, ANA, the airline, uh, Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ, Nomura Research Institute, Omron, Startia, Rakuten, and our strategic partners. So thanks to them for allowing us to do this. So let's move on. Um, we have a home page here. Uh, if you search this, it will turn up. The URL is at the top. If you go to our home page, there's a section that has research. And if you scroll down research, it has several of the papers that uh, we've uh, written, etc. Along with today, we're going to talk about the essential reading list and uh, the synthesis that I'm about to present. And there are some classics here that are a little dated, but they're actually still very much relevant. And that's the beauty of the ones that we've selected. So, uh, and we're gonna talk a lot today about Martin Kenny's edited volume, Understanding Silicon Valley. Martin Kenny is a good friend and a collaborator of ours, and he's in uh, UC Davis. And he, more re a more recent book of his, uh, Historian, uh, and uh, Annalise Axenian's Regional Advantage. Uh, she's very well known, one of the first people who analyzed Silicon Valley as a region when people were trying to figure out, is it a certain technology? Is it a certain set of, uh, uh, what other aspects are it? And she provided a whole holistic view of it. And her more recent volume, looking at people moving back and forth from other countries, here, a brain circulation, it will, that keeps feeding Silicon Valley. We'll talk about these in more detail in a minute. Others on this list include uh, uh, historical analysis of Silicon Valley and a very important, uh, Baidol is basically, um, we'll talk about this too, but basically university industry relations. There's an image of how university industry relations works and people have an image of how it works, which is often different from how it actually works. And so some of these go into look at that. And this is a very recent book, oh, sorry, the date is missing, uh, that just compares the San Francisco and Los Angeles areas that were roughly comparable in the 70s and diverged significantly. And they try to figure out why. And uh, here with our project, we co-authored a paper that synthesizes a lot of these and looks at the institutional foundations of Silicon Valley and compares it to uh, places in Japan, et cetera. 
or Japan's overall institutions, and looks for um, ways in which institutions in Japan could be modified or altered to sustain more growth, or which ones in Silicon Valley should be harnessed if the ones in Japan can't be altered very quickly to uh, mimic what's happening here. So, so that's the list, and pulling out from this list a set of key characteristics, and you probably have seen various versions of this type of slide before. Well, we're just going to go through this very quickly and then I delve into the details about where these come from. So the dual ecosystem of large firms and small, fast-growth startups, right? People focus on startups when they think of Silicon Valley, but the biggest exit is M&A, and who's buying these firms? It's large firms. So it's the coexistence of these large firms that buy the small firms, as well as send people out when people leave the large firms. It's a dual ecosystem. Highly competitive industries, and there's a balance between open innovation, right, bringing in ideas from the outside, bringing in people from the outside, and secrecy protection, right? We are often surprised, sometimes in, not in a good way, on what Apple's doing next because we don't know, uh, or what Google's doing, et cetera. So the, they are very secretive, but at the same time, open. And so some places that try to mimic Silicon Valley look at just the open part and say, well, it's difficult to make everything open, but at the same time, it's a balance here in Silicon Valley between being very secretive. Other places, they say, we can't have our intellectual property uh, uh, sort of be stolen elsewhere, so they be very secretive, but there isn't the balance, so it doesn't work so well. High financial returns for successful entrepreneurs and startups' early employees. That's why rent is so expensive here. Uh, and you know, if you're a university employee, you can't buy a house. Separate problem. Uh, <laughs> but then finance and governance of startups by venture capital. Venture capital, as we'll show later, is really the linchpin of a lot of this. That's what makes it distinct from other types of uh, financing models, which helps drive the ecosystem of having vibrant startup ecosystem because the exits for venture capital are either IPOs or to get M&A, get, get bought out. And so there's a pressure to uh, grow them quickly and uh, send out. And high levels and diverse human resources for all stages of startups, right? There are entrepreneurs, there are people that are early followers, there are people who are very good at getting small companies to a medium size, a different set of people who are very good at making medium-sized companies larger, etc. And the human resources pool is very deep and high level levels of labor mobility at all levels. Right? It's not just the entry level workers that move back and forth, it's the top executives that move from rival firm to rival firm. Uh, Google executives becoming Facebook executives, etc. Top class universities, um, that's one of the anchor points, right? There's Stanford, there's UC Berkeley, there's uh, UCSF Medical School, etc. <clears throat> and uh, UC Davis, right, which matters for Napa Valley, et cetera. And extensive government role in shaping technological tra trajectories and basic science. If you talk to some entrepreneurs who are in the private market area, they'll say the government has nothing to do with it. You look in the history and you realize that government had a very, very much to do with the historical development of Silicon Valley. Business infrastructure, law firms, accounting firms, mentors, et cetera, the whole ecosystem of players where each of these players have vast experience with startups and merging them, et cetera. So there's deep knowledge in all the peripheral, non-core, not, it's not just the uh, startups themselves or the large firms buying startups, expertise is in all of these places. And we'll introduce a chapter that talks about the various firm, uh, roles that law firms can play. And acceptance of failure. Right? It's not necessarily a negative if you have a company and then it goes under. It could be seen as a positive experience and as often is, which is actually, it's not just culture, right? It's effective evaluation and monitoring. Was that a good way to fail? Uh, was it something that was out of the funder's control that it failed? Uh, versus, right, it's not just failure per se. If you fail for the wrong reasons, then you don't have a second chance. But if you fail for very good reasons, then it's often seen as a plus, which is very different from most other parts of the world, and a, a legal platform that facilitates this. California is a very interesting place in terms of uh, labor law and IP protection. We'll go into that later. So let's jump into, uh, we're going to go through a bunch of chapters uh, from Martin Kenney's uh, book, uh, Understanding Silicon Valley. And, oh, yeah. Do you mind going back to, to one slide? There's a couple of things I didn't see on there, and maybe you're going to cover them. But one is, the large firms are early adopters. So willing to take risk. That's unique in a lot of areas mm -hmm. of the world. Yes, large firms are 
willing to work with startup firms and willing to buy startup firms or buy their services or products at an early stage where a lot of large firms in the Startups rest of the country. Startups early adopters. Absolutely. They cannot survive without early adopters. Large firms are willing to take a risk and do early adoption. That's very critical to success. Yes. Thank you for that. And so the point of how Silicon Valley came to be, let's look at the history, because part of the lesson is people coming to try to figure out Silicon Valley uh, do need to understand where it came from to understand where it's going, because you can see the trajectory. And so these slides will be available later. This is essentially a summary of some of the chapters in this book. But interestingly enough, um, it was the characteristics of early Bay Area electronics companies that closely matched the structure of the industrial organization. So when a lot of uh, fast innovation was happening with semiconductors, it was conducive to new firms coming in and innovating one piece of that and then moving to the next one, which is uh, it's an interesting contrast with, say, the area around UC Berkeley, which a lot of the concentration was initially on um, applied physics for nuclear research, which is not conducive to spinning off startups because it's more basic research and it went into government labs. And as we'll see eventually, UC Berkeley is definitely part of the uh, ecosystem. But some of the characteristics that were existing um, in the pre-war period, like a leading role for local venture capital, close relationship between local industry and major research universities, and a, a usually high level of inter-firm cooperation, tolerance for spin-offs, and um, uh, a sort of opposition to traditional, well-established firms. All these have a deep historical antecedent, and they've been accentuated in the 1960s onward. And one view of the military's role in Silicon Valley is that it was actually one of the first and biggest uh, angel investors, where the Department of Defense was willing to, and uh, was willing to actually procure from fairly, at the time, not well-known startups. And the historical context is the Cold War, where massive processing power was needed, semiconductors were critical to that, and so semiconductor development, firms that developed semiconductors in this area were able to enter Department of Defense procurement uh, engagements, which turned out to then provide uh, funding to do their subsequent activities as uh, Varian Associates. So people then left there, started the next round of firms, etc. And if you look into the book, there are several topologies of the initial set of semiconductor, um, uh, uh, well, a, a startup, William Shockley, who came and he was not, a, he, he basically invented the transistor. And then he was a manager of the type that all his best people wanted to leave very quickly. They all left very quickly, and including in, included in there are people like Gordon Moore, who started Intel, uh, the people that started Varian Associates, etc. So, but this was a very big deal. Before venture capital was highly established here, the Department of Defense was a big buyer of things that were developed by Silicon Valley, which were then startups. Law firms play a variety of roles. Uh, we often get visitors to Silicon Valley, and some of them are from law firms or accounting firms, and they're very puzzled by how the fee structures work. Uh, how can you be paid in equity when that might not pay off? Well, a lot of them don't pay off, but the ones that do can become a very big deal. So you have an incentive to try to figure out which ones are going to become a big deal. And uh, Mark Sukman has gone in, and he identified that, and this is probably still true, to, uh, to a, a large degree today, law firms play a variety of roles. They're not just transaction folks. They're deal makers, they're counselors, they're gatekeepers, they're proselytizers, and they're matchmakers. So very, and this developed in a very entrepreneurial system as, uh, as Silicon Valley law firms wanted to differentiate themselves from San Francisco-based law firms and the big ones on the East Coast, but since it's, uh, well, yeah, and San Francisco. And venture capital is really the linchpin of this, sorry for the font size, um, where if you think about what really makes Silicon Valley startups distinctive, it's that they're VC financed. And the incentives that come along with that tend to be going for high growth in a way that other forms of capital don't provide so well. 
So uh, they go through the history of how venture capital developed, the legal changes such as pension funds being allowed to uh, invest into VCs, which vastly expanded the pool of funding available to VCs to invest. And in their view, um, the Silicon Valley venture capitalists really um, innovated the limited partnership model, which is key to allowing VCs to perform in the way that they do. And that, was, that enabled them to uh, go well beyond bank financing, which was their initial set of funds they were using, and to vastly expand their activities and then invest into startups all over. And interestingly enough, and we see this, um, we, we see this in other places too, but in, once venture capital became successful and started to grow, uh, they created a, their own industry association and lobbied Washington for some changes, such as the, and they take credit for lowering the capital gains tax from almost 50% to just over 25%, which then enabled the returns to be much higher. And so we have a case of... Uh, uh, successful industry being born, which then gets political clout, which then changes regulations that favor it. And that worked out in Silicon Valley's case. And one of the interesting recent developments <coughs> excuse me, is a uh, confusion about, well, where is Silicon Valley? Because original Silicon Valley was here. It was basically Santa Clara County, and it's where all the silicon and uh, the semiconductor factories and whatnot were. But if we think about it as uh, venture capital financed startups as part of the ecosystem, then absolutely San Francisco, parts of San Francisco are included too, right? Twitter, Salesforce, and well before that, uh, Genentech, et cetera. So, so there's a startup ecosystem that basically has all the features of Silicon Valley that has now expanded into San Francisco and then places in between as well as uh, firms run out of space and go in between. And then since uh, the production of so many millionaires and well-to-do people in this area has made land prices, housing prices, rental prices so high, a lot of people live on, in the East Bay and then commute across the uh, in, entirely inadequate number of bridges and the, no public transportation in terms of trains, etc. So, so if we think about it, a lot of places that try to figure out lessons from Silicon Valley often point to, oh, it's got to be good infrastructure and they're thinking backwards. There's got to be good infrastructure because there are a lot of development. It's the opposite. The infrastructure is terrible here for commuting if you've ever, some of you maybe commute over here, from over here. And so, and then of course leads to business chances like Uber, right? Taxis are terrible. There's not enough public transportation. Let's figure out a private solution, et cetera. But um, I would argue that the broader Silicon Valley ecosystem, which includes white collar workers, along with uh, the high paid workers, et cetera, would encompass this broader area. And a very interesting uh, experiment with uh, Google Maps that I saw recently that I couldn't resist sharing is Whole Foods, right? High income, nicknamed Whole Paycheck, depending on what your paycheck is, mine for sure. Whole Paycheck, a high, high end uh, grocery store, it's in the high income areas. And then Walmart, it's in the not high income areas. And there's a clear demarcation of where Whole Foods is, is almost exactly where Walmart isn't. And they're almost entirely mutually exclusive. So you can sort of uh, proxy the income distribution on how that is developing. And it's probably getting worse. Labor mobility, uh, corporate boundaries being porous. Um, this is something that we're familiar with. If you're trying to uh, make a business in Silicon Valley, it's very difficult to retain employees. It's very costly, et cetera. And this is a historical pattern. And uh, uh, along with uh, a chapter in uh, Martin Kenney's volume, this is one of the major aspects that uh, got Annalise Axelian's regional advantage. It became one of the most famous books explaining Silicon Valley. And her more recent one, which is relevant for... Um, uh, arguments about brain drain, which is looking into a lot of the successful people in Silicon Valley, noting that they came from places increasingly uh, like Taiwan and India, uh, Israel, and was this a brain drain for those places? Well, if you follow their careers here, it turns more into a brain circulation, where they bring their interpersonal networks here and then can move back and forth and take advantage of the resources from home and here and then bridge them in a way. And 
to Japanese audiences, I always say that she's very comprehensive in covering all the groups, and there's one particular group that's very puzzling that's not there, uh, of highly educated, very hardworking, extremely wealthy uh, country origin people, and that's uh, Japan. Right? Japan has not been historically part of this, and so let's do something about that is what, uh, and then so then let's figure out how, which is one of the things that we do in our project. But the labor mobility, from large firms to small firms, um, my friend I play soccer with, I talk to him, oh, what do you do? I work at you know, big company X. I talk to him a few months later, what are you doing? Oh, I started my own company. Great, that's very typical. Talk to him again, what are you doing? Oh, I'm back in company X. Oh, okay, you got bought up because you knew people there and you were doing something the big company couldn't do at a low price. Fine, I meet him again a few months later or maybe a year later. I say, what are you doing? Oh, I started my own thing again. Okay, well, good for you. And then I see him again. Well, what are you doing now? You seem to be driving a Tesla. And uh, Did you get big financing? I say, no, no, I got bought out again by company X. And so you just go back and forth. That's very typical, right? And uh, most large company cultures elsewhere, once you leave, it's much harder to come back in uh, if you're not at a very top executive level. So. Uh, and, and this has been a, a historical pattern for quite some time. And so the concept of flexible recycling, right? People are recycled and resources are recycled. Plenty of firms that then don't work out. The people come out. They have experience under their belt. They come together in different configurations and uh, things cycle around. And an anchor of one of this is uh, this process is enhanced by the absence of the typical stigma associated with organizational failure. So this is back to that first chart. And the dual economy conception, right? So there, and, th and this is underappreciated, and this uh, speaks to the gentleman's comment earlier. Convent so there are two e important sets of economies that coexist. One is the conventional ag activities of existing organizations, such as established firms and other organizations like universities, corporate research laboratories. And the second is a fabric of institutions aimed at encouraging and nurturing new firm formation. And these two are linked, and so, but they're conceptually distinct. And that's what we need to make sure we understand, especially as we're figuring out how to navigate Silicon Valley, how we're gonna figure out how to take lessons from it or harness it. These two things coexist. Now, uh, a separate set of, it's a special issue uh, with a lot of uh, contributors looking at what happened to U.S. In academic institutions after the passing of, after the promulgation of the Baydol, Baydol Act um, in the, uh, let's see, was it 1980? Yeah, when it was passed. I mean, this was passed in the context of the U.S. recession and stagflation after the oil shocks. And what Bay Dole allowed was it allowed the ownership of an invention from federal research funding to reside with the university, small business, or nonprofit. Before that, so if you're a professor and you invent something, or you're a graduate student and you invent something, the university owns the IP. Before that, if it was a federal grant, the federal government owned the IP. And the federal government realized that the federal government is not very good at monetizing the vast trove of IP that they have, intellectual property. So this was a shift to try to um, uh, move that forward. So, so then, um, and, and, and the amounts of uh, government budget assigned to research, even in the 70s, was not trivial. So this was a big change in the, uh, where the rights were assigned. These things don't happen very often. So it was a very interesting experiment. And after Baidu was enacted, universities all over established technology transfer offices. And this is what the rest of the world is basically looking at to try to figure out how to harness university-produced intellectual property and get it to uh, produce maximum value in industry. So, so the question is, how well did it work? And a lot of people look at Stanford and they say, well, it seems to be working well, and so let's try to mimic that. But we need to be evidence-based about this. So let's look at Stanford's T Technology Licensing Office, because again, we, we get a stream of visitors who always want to say, I want to learn about university industry relations. Can you, can you introduce me to somebody at Stanford's Technology Licensing Office? And they say, well, first, take a look at this slide. So it was established in 1970. Uh, over 10,000 patents and invention, invention disclosures since then, so approximately 4,200 licenses in addition to that, and about 1,200 active. Over the 44 years, 
1.6 billion were generated by royalties. Great, that's a lot of money. But over a billion of that came from only three big inventions. This is not, three out of 10,000 is not a very good batting average. Those are the big winners. And, and then those three out of 10,000 generated two thirds of all the income over the course of the entire lifespan of Stanford's technology licensing office. Remember, Stanford is the place that most people look at and say it's working the best, and it probably is one of the ones way up there, right? So only 33 cases generated over 5 million, and 87 generated 1 million or more in royalties. So let's put this in comparative perspective. And well, in 2014, 108 million in royalty revenue, uh, 644 inventions generated income, but they only, uh, and they brought over 100,006 cases, brought in a million or more. Legal expenses were 9.8 million, which was just under 10% of the revenue. Let's put this in perspective. Stanford's total operating budget a few years ago for one year was 4.4 billion. So 1.6 billion over 44 years versus uh, this is what it costs to run this place. So, uh, and then of that 1.27 was in sponsored research and 84 of that was from government sponsors. So the bottom line is um, that so the bottom line is that this does not actually cover the operating budget of uh, Stanford. And it's alarming in some ways when I see fairly commonly the uh, policy discussion happening of places that are trying to revamp their university system, saying, let's let the universities take all the IP that's hidden, that's not being utilized very well, spin them out, and let's use that for university operating revenue. Okay, you can do that, but if this is Stanford, then chances are it's not gonna work so well, and you'll be disappointed, and then you have to redo it a few years from that. So let's make sure that we understand this first before we take any drastic measures. That's the simple point that I'm making. So then what do industry-university relationships look like? And the point is that a lot of it is very difficult to measure. It's easier to count patents and value them and look at royalty income and whatnot. But the reality is that university-industry relationships are multifaceted and complex. Right? There are various ways that interactions happen. Licensing, yes, but academic spin-offs, collaborative research, contract research, consulting, ad hoc device, and networking for practitioners, teaching, personnel exchanges, and even student supervision. All of these mechanisms are, are of course, outside the TLO office coordination model of university industry interactions. Right? Google's uh, so Google created so an incredible amount of wealth, even if you look historically at the history of humankind, in a short number of years, amount of wealth generated by their advertising uh, matching algorithm. And there's an auction mechanism behind that. Hal Varian, who was an economist at UC Berkeley, took a sabbatical year in the early years of Google before Google had a business model but they had a lot of data. He said, well, this looks cool. Let me go spend my sabbatical there and then uh, analyze this data and we can do something fun with auctions. His sabbatical year there led to the basis of their auction mechanism, which then got incorporated into their AdWords, AdSense, uh, search engine uh, advertisement business model that generated all this wealth. So was that a UC Berkeley royalty? No. Was it a license? No. Was it a patent? No. But he moved over, produced all of this, went back, and then eventually Google did so well that uh, they invited him over as, a, as the chief uh, economist, and he said, well, that looks like fun, and he moved over. Academic university collaboration in a way that conventional ways of measuring it can't capture. This is some of the value. And so industry visitors spending time in universities, Right? And then seeing, oh, these graduate students are great, let's hire them. Or uh, people moving back and forth, people doing things on the side. And so it's the bi-directional ties between university and industry, because people keep making these diagrams that have university, and then an arrow to industry, and it says intellectual property, and then that, that's the value. It goes both ways. Because, uh, and this is coming from Martin Kenny's uh, 2014 edited book, or, well, and this is uh, Le Cuyer's, but um, a common theme is that the industry environment surrounding the university is critical to shaping what the universities contribute to local development. So, say in Stanford or UC Berkeley's case, or uh, Silicon Valley area, some of the questions are theoretically interesting, but of vital importance to industry. 
So then, professors here working on that, researchers here working on that, they solve theoretical issues that is also of great value to industry. If the industry isn't right there to have this back and forth, that kind of dynamic is very difficult to uh, enact and sustain. But that's exactly what's been happening here. So uh, it's absolutely not a one-way street with university technologies harvested by industry, and the industry context matters a great deal in these interchanges. And and yeah, and so income from license and patenting is not the primary reason that, that researchers engage in these activities. And um, the value actually for the university often lies in the long-term relationships with industries because it gives faculty competitiveness in the next round of federally funded research, which is actually the main portion of university research income. So there's this dynamic too, where successful academic industry collaborations actually help feed uh, major grants coming in. So if you look around Stanford, most of the new buildings that are made uh, are coming from some of this. So a little while ago, BioX and some of the uh, bioengineering style things. And then, of course, there are investments into philanthropic gifts. Right In 2001, Stanford received uh, 400 million from the Hewlett Foundation. In 2012, Stanford's total <coughs> gift income was over a billion. And many of these were from uh, people who were Stanford graduates or worked with Stanford and then were very successful and then gave back. So, and, and strong industry university ties can lead to new private public partnerships, right? The uh, five, it was a little controversial, but $500 million tenure contract between BP and primarily UC Berkeley, these kinds of things. And Stanford has a huge array of these. Now, um, transitioning to uh, what Kanetaka is going to be talking about a little bit, but taking a step back from that, university entrepreneurship. Because a lot of universities around the world are looking to figure out how to increase their university students or faculty as um, one of the hubs of entrepreneurship. So Forbes is most entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial research university. Stanford's number one in 2014. UC Berkeley's number three. And PitchBook, if we look at that, uh, Stanford is, has the most. Uh, UC Berkeley has second. So then, well, what, how does Stanford or Berkeley work to, harness, to uh, produce all of this entrepreneurship? What's the curriculum? What's the program? Well, interestingly enough, and this isn't appreciated enough from the outside, uh, neither has explicit incentives. There are all sorts of implicit incentives, but explicit incentives for faculty or students to become un involved in entrepreneurship. You're not going to get tenure on the basis, tenure which is li uh, basically lifetime employment uh, for faculty who are brought in with limited time spans, and then you get tenure and stay, or you don't get tenure and you leave. Uh, so. Tenure promotions, these are not necessary. It's not whether you made a certain number of companies or not, which is the opposite of what some places are trying to do. Uh, some universities around the world are trying to uh, make that an explicit um, goal, which that's fine if it works for them, but that's not how it works here. So as long as you know that, it's fine. And entrepreneurship, um, according to Lenoir, uh, who was talking to a lot of people here, uh, it's instead viewed as a way to retain high quality faculty by allowing them to pursue their business interests while remaining at the university, because otherwise they could go to the to private industry. And well, given housing prices here, maybe you know, the, it, it is necessary to keep them. So, but the point there is being involved in entrepreneurship. You can be on the cutting edge of all sorts of things, which enhances your teaching, which brings more people, and enhances your research, which brings better people, and you get in this positive feedback loop. So that's it for here. So now we've talked about academic entrepreneurship as the ending point. Uh, the, other, um, the other various readings there are there. Eventually, we will put up uh, sort of reading notes if you'd like. We'll do some directed readings and little study groups and put them up as a little cheat sheet. Although I recommend that it's not a substitute for actually reading those works because they're uh, really uh, in-depth. And just talking about what some of the main arguments are to people who are trying to figure out what's going on can be very value added. So. So thank you, that's it for me. Let's move to Kanetaka and his new research, because this was mostly existing research. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the, my new research titled The Milestone to University-Based Startup Success. What is the impact of academic inventors' involvement? So let me start with my background. 
So I'm, I'm currently a research associate at the Stanford APERC. And prior to coming to the US, I was, the, uh, I was working at Keio University to launch the uh, university-based ecosystem. So there I supported lots of university-based startups. So the talk, I'm going to talk uh, I will talk today will be based on both of my practical experience in Japan and the academic research in the US. Yes. Oh, by the way, this is the joint work with Martin Kenny, which uh, Kenji talked a lot about his uh, previous research. So let me start with this diagram. These are famous startups. What are the common characteristics of these startups? Anybody? Oh, by the way, I want to make this session as interactive as possible, even though I know you half of you are from Japan, so not getting used to that much. Anybody? There's a Stanford footprint. <laughs> All of this. Yeah, but not all of them. No. You're not talking about yes, that is correct. <laughs> so these are all of the university-based startups. And according to Scott Chain, uh, university-based start startups are, uh, are unique in many ways. One is that they are relatively high-performing companies. And in addition to that, they enhance commercialization of technologies. Otherwise, without those startups, nobody could take care of the commercialization. So because of these two reasons, research on university-based startup is particularly important. Then let me ask next question. How many of you know the founder or like inventor or founder of the Google? Anyone can say who? Who started the company? No, who started the company? I mean, I mean that as an entrepreneur. Right, so these are the founders, right? So the next question is, who are the founders of the Cisco systems? That this is also a very famous Silicon Valley-based company, right? Anybody can answer this? Okay, so these two are the founders. So my question is that why everybody knows the founder of the Google, but not the Cisco founders? Yeah, I have. Exactly. So does inventor's involvement assist or distract the success of the startup? That is my question to talk about today. And for the university-based startup research, one of the most controversial um, question has been the importance of the inventor involvement as a founding team. Let's go to the next slide. So these are the, all of the startups from University of California that went to the public. And these three firms are the uh, uh, firms that inventors actually involved as the uh, founding team. And for these two firms, they, they also went to public, but none of the inventors involved as a founders. So the advocates of the uh, people who say inventors involvement is, more, is important, they say because, uh, because of the inventors involvement, it's increase the knowledge transfer from university to startups. So that's the main reason why they're important. But on the other hand, opponents of the inventors involvement, they say that they're damn academics. Their involvement retards the success. So what I aim is to reconcile these two contracting view uh, uh, of the inventor involvement uh, by analyzing the data set. Is this clear to everybody? Do I get your attention to this? I hope so. Okay, that's good. So my analysis is a little complicated, so I want to start with the summary of what I found. So if you got the over picture, uh, big picture, that makes you much easier to capture what I'm going to talk about. So inventors involvement, and there is a success of the startup. And when I say success of startups, there are two indicators. One is the firm's survival. The firms, in other words, they don't bankrupt. The other is a successful exit, IPO or uh, going to public or M&A. Then, inventor's involvement has the direct positive impact on survival, but there is no impact on successful exit. That's first finding. Then, when we put the intermediate steps, which I will explain later, these 
intermediate steps seems to have positive impact on survival and success, for example. Then, to summarize, for the uh, inventor's involvement, impact on to the survival, uh, inventor's involvement seems to assist. For the successful exit, it seems until intermediate steps, inventor involvement helps, but not after intermediate steps. This is the summary of what I found. Is this clear to everybody so far? Okay, then let's go to... And this research is relatively new because of a couple of reasons. Um, there are uh, previous research streams in this field. However, they are mostly based on case studies because of it's very difficult to uh, aggregate this kind of a data set. One is, you know, it's always a small sample size, or it's not comprehensive enough, in other words, not enough of the variables. And also, success bias. If we make the data set today, we can only gather startups that survives right now. So that's success bias. However, because of the support of the University of California's uh, Office of President, they made the uh, uh, data set of uh, University of California-based, patent-based uh, startup data set, which includes about uh, 550 startups from the year 2000. And interestingly, this is the full population of university patent-based startups. And I claim this is the largest data set in, this world, in the world uh, to do this kind of research. So let me a little bit talk about the research hypothesis of the, what I've done. So as I said, explanatory variable is the inventor's involvement. And we want to see the impact on the ultimate success, which, uh, which are the survival and successful exit. And as the intermediate steps, we use the financial milestone of the startups, which, which are SPIR funding, venture capital funding, and the first sales. First sales means a, a first sales by product launch. So these are the three of the steps. Then, how many of you are familiar with the SBIR grant? Should I explain this? Anybody who doesn't know? Okay, it's good to explain. So SBIR is a government-based policy that supports the small and medium uh, firms. So most of the, uh, the, so there are many of the research grants by uh, federal government. And those uh, grants, uh, they are required to allocate 2.8% of the, all of the grants to uh, small and medium firms. So, so some of the researchers claim that this is the, one of the reasons why uh, a startup in the U.S. is success because of this program. So this is SBIR, which is a particularly important for a, a startup a milestone at least. So in fact, all of these funding agencies, NIH, NASF, DOD, whatever you know for the uh, funding agency, they all have the SBIR uh, grant system. So this is a mechanism. So, there is, so we want to check that inventor involvement has the direct impact on survival rate. However, there is also a, a, a indirect impact through SBIR funding. Uh, technically, we call this is a mediation uh, or between the inventor's involvement on the impact of survival rate. So in other words, because of uh, uh, inventor's involvement increased the SBIR fund, the probability of receiving SBIR funding, the survival rate increase. So that's the mechanism of the, this chart. So similarly, how does the venture capital funding mediates the relationship and the first sales of the product launch? So these are the hypotheses 1A, 1B, 1C. Is this clear? Am I talking too fast? Is it okay? Or oh, whether feel free to ask any questions at any time. Any questions so far? I'm curious about the data, how you, uh, in, in this database, that they have information on the role of the uh, in, that, in you know in first sales and and getting SB, SBIR and so on. So that's actually stated in the in the data. Set. 
uh, not all of them, but uh, the, uh, the data set captures some of them. I will explain that when I talk about the data set. Uh, yeah. uh, so inventory involvement enables some kind of funding, funding or money coming to the company, which enables companies to survive uh -huh. and uh, deal with it. Uh -huh. so, uh, so I get that part. But after getting the funding, uh -huh. you said there's no correlation, no uh, advantage of having the actual image. I think these are cases where it's negative. According to my analysis, I did not find any of the negative impact. All I found is there was no positive impact. However, adding, uh, the connecting to the prior research stream, there are many research that explains that the turnover of the founders is effective for the successful exit. So that means there's a negative impact. For the, for the other research, some people claim that. But in this data set, we cannot say that. All we can say is, is to guess. OK, let me go. And similarly, now we change the uh, ultimate uh, 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 goal, which is now we look at the relationship of a successful exit and how does these three variables mediate the impact. OK, so this is what I'm going to talk about by this analysis. Any questions so far? It's interesting, I get more questions when I talk in Japan. <laughs> Any? Is it okay? Okay. So let me talk about the uh, data set. So data set is the entire population of startups uh, based on the University of California system from 2000 to 2013. This includes the 400 and 541 startups. And the variables of in this uh, database, so it's going back to your question, uh, is that includes the name of the firm, name of the f uh, founders, name of the inventors of that patent, and the affiliation of founders if they were in, in university or outside of the university. And the calendar year of the incorporation, exit year, reason for exit, firm's fate. Then they also have includes like existence of the uh, uh, product on the market, or like uh, SBIR, grant if, uh, and venture capital funding and uh, receipt of the royalty because this is a patent base and the university really want to capture the profit so it, it should be very accurate when they have the product or not. Then, as I think all of you know, you know uh, University of California system has uh, 10 campuses, five medical schools and uh, three national laboratories and uh, so on. And uh, six of the uh, campuses are listed among the top 50 universities in the world. So, you know, this is a high reputation uh, university system. Then, just to show you, this is interesting result. Uh, so, I'm, by the way, I'm from UCSD, so when I talk in UCSD, I ask this as a question. So, which of the 10 campuses generated the most startups? And interestingly, UCSD is, is the most. It's not from UC, it's not UC Berkeley. However, UC Berkeley does not have the medical school. So in that sense, we have to add UC Berkeley and UCSF. If you add those combined, the uh, Bay Area has the most. But these are uh, fairly consistent with the research budget from the government that each campus has received. Then these are the tech, technology categories of the 541 startups. So as you can see, biomedical dominates most like 60% uh, of the whole uh, 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 data set. So I, I, so I just wanted to, uh, to point this out that this is in a way biased. This is a patent based. So that means more biomedical firms are included. And usually <coughs> IT startup does not require the patents. So the, those are not included. But this is a matter of the, what's the definition of university-based startups. So in my definition, it's uh, patent-based. So that's why it's the full population. Then, how, how many of the uh, 541 firms went to public, do you think, out of 541? Some you know, Japanese government tries to like, uh, make 100 companies to go to public. That's what they were you know, claiming. How many do you think? 
50, and you said, okay, 50. Anybody? 15%? Uh -huh. Okay, anybody? So we only have five. This is all. This is, I think, it's, it's interesting to know. Then, in addition to that, M and A margin acquisition, they have forty-three. So you may, may, it's obvious, but uh, it, uh, uh, M and A is a more common exit for the university-based startups. And we add these two, so we have like a forty-eight firms that had a successful exit, which is roughly ten percent of the all of the startups. Then, uh, just to show you, this is a chart of, so this is the uh, firms that survived. Um, and as you can see, the medical, biomedical dominance. So th this is a roughly same proportion as the population of the startups. But when we look at the IPO and the successful exit, it's IT is more likely to succeed. Which is trivial, but you know, confirmed by our data set as well. There are many reasons, I think, but uh, definitely that's one reason. I will a little bit talk about the difference of the characteristics between IT and the biomedical data as well. Okay, any questions so far? Now we go into the analysis. And I don't want to talk about too much about the academic you know, techniques or analysis. So I will briefly explain what I've done. So this is the analysis I've done. So for the analysis of the sub farm survival, I use the probate analysis because of the uh, because of the nature of the data set. So it's basically uh, one and zero, dummy variables that firm survive or not. Then as the inventor's involvement for this variable, I use the proportion. So what I mean is uh, total number of inventors became founders divided by total number of the inventors. This captures the magnitude of the inventor's involvement on the startup. And uh, I will a little bit talk about what's other indicators for this, but, but this is what I used. Then I control the industry sector, like a biomedical or IT or different. Then, of course, there's a characteristic by campuses. For example, in Silicon Valley, UC Berkeley and UCSF must have a different characteristic from UC Davis, let's say. So, you know, those are the campus characteristics. Then also, there's a boom of the launching a startup. So I control the uh, incorporate year dummy variables, and also the intermediate steps. Then what I found is inventor's involvement has a direct impact on survival rate. It was statistically significant. Then for the intermediate variables, SPIR uh, funding uh, is that, uh, positively significant on survival rate. And the same for venture funding and for sales. So all of these were positively significant, basically. Then, now we look at the intermediate steps, which is SPIR grant, venture funding, and fast sales. And all of the control variables are basically the same. Then, see, you can see. SPIR, hand, uh, so uh, inventor's involvement has a positive impact on SPIR funding. But there is no impact on venture funding. And th this is also interesting result, I think, which I will explain about it a little bit later. Then, for the first sales, there's a positive impact. And interestingly, I mean, yeah, this is going back to maybe your question. A biomedical sector, first sales, the probability of the uh, launching a product is lower for a biomedical sector in comparison with IT, which is trivial but confirmed by data. Then, this is a statistical technique we, we use in the management research, which we call the mediation test, which means does the mediating variable like SPIR grant mediates the relationship between inventor's involvement and survival rate. And we have to satisfy for, uh, several conditions on this, which is there should be direct impact of the inventor's involvement survival rate and direct impact on uh, SPIR funding to the mediator. 
Then, when we control these two variables together, together SPIL finding must be significant. And when we con uh, compare these two variables, this coefficient must become smaller than the original one. This is a technique to show. So, uh, as you can see, SPIR grant mediates the relationship between invaders' involvement and survival. Then for the venture funding, because there is no direct impact on venture funding, it does not mediate. Then when we go to first sales, it satisfies all of the requirements I mentioned. So it's confirmed. So as I can see, uh, as a result, uh, uh, hypothesis H1A and H1C, SPIR grant and first sales mediates relation, relationship. This is the first part of the analysis. Any questions so far? Good. Com convincing? I hope it's convincing to you. Okay. So this is the summary of what I found. Inventor's involvement has a direct impact on survival analysis, a survival rate. Then there is an impact on SPR funding and first sales product launch. Then the, there are the impact from these intermediate variables. So in other words, there is a, a uh, uh, causal chain between inventor's involvement, SBR funding, and survival rate, and for the inventor's involvement, first sales, and survival rate. So this is the essence of what mediation is about. Okay, so let's go to next, uh, the second part, which is a successful exit. So uh, for the successful exit, we use a different uh, statistical technique because we have the exact date of the IPO and M&A. So now we can not only, uh, we can also look the uh, uh, length of the, uh, of the achieving the, that event of like IPO, M&A. And uh, basically, uh, Control variables are almost the same, except I also control the age of the firm that uh, event has, uh, has happened. So uh, for there's a dummy variables uh, for my thresholds. For the uh, analysis of the exit, I use the four and seven years as a threshold. And for the intermediate variables, I use two and three years, which I will explain a little bit later with what is the result. So, doing this analysis, what I found is inventor's involvement is not significant for the successful exit. Then, for the SBIR funding, uh, is significant on successful exit. And venture funding is uh, significant for success exit. And uh, first sales, the product launch was not significant. And as you can see, so this is what I've talked about. So this is the dummy variable that explains uh, uh, the age of the farm. It's the, so this is the far farms that uh, age is four to seven years. And this uh, row is more than seven years. When all of them are negatively significant. And when we compare the size of the coefficient, Uh, the coefficient is larger for the more than seven years. That means the longer firm survives, less likely to exit. So success early or fail, that's, uh, that's the point uh, from this analysis. Then again, biomedical sector, less likely to success, which is understandable. Then SBIR funding, all of the, uh, so invent, impact of inventor involvement on SBIR funding is positively significant. Then there was the uh, association between first sales and the SBIR funding, which might be, uh, which does make sense because SBIR funding aims to launch a product and they get the uh, non-dilutive funding, so that helps. Then what's weird is the, so the, this is tough to explain in an easy way, but the interaction effect of inventor's involvement and venture funding is negatively significant, which is, I will explain the interpretation of this later, but this is interesting. And again, the longer firm survives, less likely to receive SBI grant funding. Then now venture funding, it was not significant. There was no impact on inventor's involvement. 
and there was a uh, association with first sales. And again, the, the interaction effect of the uh, inventor involvement and SBI fund is negatively uh, marginally significant. And again, uh, the firm survives less likely to receive venture funding. And first sales. So there's a direct impact of the uh, inventor's involvement on the product launch of first sales. And there was association with uh, venture funding. Then again, yeah, the longer firm survives. So there is no hope for <laughs> firms to survive in the aspect of the successful exit, basically. Then for the mediation test, since there is no direct impact, the, all of the mediation tests are rejected for a hypothesis to A, to B, and to C. So then this is the summary of the, uh, uh, of the mechanism, what I've talked about. So inventor's involvement has a SBI, uh, has a, uh, impact on SBIR funding and first sales, but not the direct impact. And the SBIR funding seems to mediate, uh, to have a positive impact on successful exit. Then this is what I found, that, you know, that this is the interaction effect. What mean is a conditional on, on a venture uh, capital funding. The uh, greater proportion of inventors involvement actually uh, has negative impact on SBI funding. This is very tough to interpret and understand, but, but I'll talk about it later again. Now, let, okay, any questions so far? Can you go back to the prior slide just for a second? This one? Yes. Okay. okay. What does the minus sign there mean? Yes, that's exactly the puzzling part, which I will talk about a little bit in the conclusion part. But one interpretation is that these two, is probably, potentially, SBI funding and venture funding are the substitutes. They don't get together. That might be one interpretation, which is quite interesting, because if the firm receives SBI funding, they won't receive venture funding, probably. If that's true, that's very interesting finding. Okay. Did I answer your question? Okay, go ahead, yes. Sorry, uh, could you explain a little bit more on uh, inventor's involvement? Is that the development of the product or service that an engineer, or does that cover development of strategic planning for marketing business, or even the sales, or combination of all these things? So, or being a public face for the other people? So I, I, at, uh, I would say including all of them. And I don't do case studies at this point. All I have is the data. And, at, and, and, uh, and the definition of data is that the definition of inventor is all of the uh, people <laughs> who, whose name was on the list of the patent. That's the definition of inventors. Then founders, there's a definition of founder for each startup. So I look at the overlap. And I think your point is true that I need to do some more interviews of these startups to see more of the mechanism of the, what the inventor involvement is really is. That's also the next step. Okay, so let me uh, talk a little bit more, more about the, what's interesting about our results. So, SBIR funding and venture funding and for sales. Are they, is there any a chronological order for this? So many people believe that SBIR funding, this is a grant to make the prototype of the product. So usually, uh, I think there's a typo. Anyway, uh, SBIR funding should occur prior to first sales. That's, you know, uh, that's a common intuition, I think. And also, uh, I think there's a typo in this slide. So I will skip, but I want to know the order of the D3 milestones. Then what I've done is the, using the data set, I created dummy variables of the uh, 
uh, of each event. So when SBI occurs prior to venture capital, the SBI basically becomes one. And if it's uh, the opposite, it becomes zero. And I created all of these uh, Barami variables. And uh, hypothetically, if this occurs randomly, the expected value must be 0 0.5. So is there, is there any uh, differ from the 0 0.5? What's the analysis? And what I found is, okay, this is a the result. There was uh, evidence that SBIR funding occurs prior to venture capital funding. And the first sales product launch occurs prior to venture funding. Uh, by the way, this is unique, isn't it? Because many people believe it's opposite in some time. Then there was no evidence between SBR funding and first sales, the, uh, the order for that, which was also interesting because SBR is designed for prototyping and the launching a product. Anyway, maybe this is because of a sample size, but there was, we could not find any evidence. Then when we uh, decompose the sample to IT and biomedic biomedical startups, how are they different? And basically what I found was for the IT, that mediation of Hector didn't occur. So all of those explanation is mainly driven by biomedical firms rather than IT. That's also the finding. And for the biomedical firms, yeah, there was, so there was a little difference from the pulled sample, which was uh, first sales. Uh, there was not media, was, uh, mediation test, test didn't pass for the first sales. Okay, now let me uh, it, uh, show you one more interesting result. So as the inventor's involvement, as I said, I used proportion to, I want to capture the magnitude. But instead of using proportion, what happened if we use the dummy variables? In other words, one of the founders involved or not? How does it affect the result? And what I found interesting is that now venture capital funding is significant. That means venture capitalist does care about inventor's involvement, as a, but magnitude doesn't matter for them. So they care one inventor's involvement, but not how many. That's the finding for the venture capital, which does make sense, I think. Okay, so conclusion. So inventor involvement does matter the success of the startups. So there were direct impact effects on SBIR forces and survival, and partial effect of the on venture funding when I used the dummy variable. However, there was no direct effect on successful exit. So inventor involvement matters until intermediate steps, but not for the successful exit. So we do not have any evidence to say this, but potentially turnover of the top management team may be effective for the successful exit. These two results reconcile the two contacting views I raised in the beginning of the inventor's involvement. And new research questions. So going back to your question, one of your questions, the negative moderation effect of venture funding on inventor's involvement and SBR funding is puzzling in many ways. So what I want to try as a next step to do this research is that uh, to find out what this mechanism is about. So uh, traditionally, many people believe that SBIR and the venture funding are the funding for the different stage of the startups. In other words, they think these are the uh, complements. But as this result, probably they may be the substitutes. So potential explanation is that there are two types of startups. One is low growth startup. They care about the more inventor involvement. They look for SBI funding and the exit goal is to survive. The other is a high growth firm, which is less inventors involvement, venture funding, look for venture funding, and successful exit. Probably there are two totally different type of startups, which now we call university-based startups. Yes? Uh, when you mentioned about uh, venture capital, uh -huh. not uh, just like institutional venture capital or including some? Uh, Angels? Uh, no. no, just the institution. Uh -huh. Then let me, you know, since this, you know, this event is for practitioners, 
let me talk about the implication. One is the entrepreneurs and the inventors' perspective. Inventor involvement matters until intermediate steps. So when is a good timing for them to step down? That is is a really tough question. And uh, appropriate timing, it's tough to say, but probably after the receiving the SBI funding or product launch, that's the appropriate time. I mean, at least we have evidence that until these milestones, there's a positive impact. So that's one, yeah, potentially they, just after product launch might be a good timing for them to step down. Then for the investor's perspective, distinguish those two high growth and low growth firms is, is a fundamentally important. So, you know, yeah, that's one. And then, yeah, SBI funding and venture funding are potentially substitutes. I think this is a very interesting implication for practitioners as well. And as a future research, I do have um, uh, more uh, you know, questions to answer. So uh, one is I use the probit analysis, but that has the technically uh, censoring program, uh, which I have to deal with. So now we are gathering the new data set, including the date of the bankruptcy. So we have the more precise uh, analysis on this. Then also we are looking for the characteristics of the founding team. Does the, do the student entrepreneur and the faculty entrepreneur, are they different? Are they different in strategy or like a successful rate? So we have all that kind of data set, so we want to analyze that. Then also we want to check the gender difference. Is there any difference of the gender? Or like ethnicity, or is there any particular countries that start more companies and success. Then uh, high growth, low growth firms. And uh, also in this data set, we have all of the uh, data of the funding agency for, uh, that uh, supported the original research. So is there any uh, difference between uh, um, difference by funding agency on success of startup? You know, there are many research that explains that DOD has the, uh, is focused on applied research. So their invention is more likely to, you know, commercialize. Is it, is it true for startup or not? So we want to compare that. Then how can we generalize our results is the, uh, is the next question as well. And I think all of these uh, questions are also has a practical implication as well. So I look forward to you know, discussing with you uh, for these topics. Yes. Uh, is there any kind of uh, research? I know it's hard to quantify uh, reasons for failure. If you go to websites, you can find like 40 people who start fails. Out of money, wrong products, wrong team, blah, blah. Uh, is there any, any value to looking at each uh, company and then coming up with some statistical analysis of calls? I see. As far as I know, I don't know any of the dominating famous paper on that. But I know I've read. I, I know some of them. So if you send me email, I will you know refer to that. But but yeah, I think but but I'm <laughs> skeptical. I mean, it's very tough to analyze that and generalize that. But there are some. Okay. And okay. Another question is that getting government grants there. Bunch of small companies that basically survive only on the Yes. Right. So you, do you agree with my distinction of the two types? Yeah, I, I, uh -huh. I, I think it's, I, I can see the reason why. I see, uh -huh. And may, some of the researchers just looking for grants, research grants. So that's all they're doing. <clears throat> and there's a term, uh, SBIR mills, that they keep applying for SBIR, and they are professional on that, which is a program, I think. This, uh, okay. At the beginning yes. of your research, you were looking at the percentage of the 
uh, founders that stayed involved. Yes. And then right at the end, you switch to a binary test of was anyone in the founding team still staying involved with the company? Okay. Yes. Yeah, you, you at the end were okay. asking the question, was any of the founders, were any of them staying involved? And that changed the outcome a little bit on uh, VCs. Right. But did it change the outcome of success? Did you run the test of founder involvement on your binary test? Any, if any founder is involved, does that change the outcome of success? Uh, no. I did, I, I did do that test. And there was no direct impact on the successful exit, even after I changed the dummy variables. Okay, um, how, first of all, this is really interesting. Um, Thank you. Do you have a sense of, so the startups you're looking at that are university-based technology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. licensed, that's a, probably a small subset of the overall universe of what you might call university-based startups. Right. It's very difficult to measure this because it didn't call alumni, or what does that relationship have to be to call it university-based margins work done? Uh -huh. But how typical do you think the subset that you're finding, because it's a fairly atypical IP firm Right, right, right. Very uh -huh. typical style. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So. Right. So, yes. I have two answers to that. Well, one is, I, I, would, I claim this is a typical, with external validity on uh, biotechnology firms, because most of them are the uh, uh, patent-based. So I don't worry about that. Then what I have to worry is to analyze the characteristics of the IT firms. That's more problematic. Uh, this. And at this point, uh, there's nothing I can do. However, Martin and I are discussing that creating a new data set of the IT with non-patent data set. So using that, we can compare the, 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 the result of these two. Then I think I can answer to that your question. So that's on the, our long list of the, what we want to do. But thank you for that. OK, yeah, Matsuo-san. You just uh, simply describe inventors' environment. Uh -huh. But there must be a lot of different inventors. Yes. Some inventors are very technical. Some are much more wider view. Do you have any distinguish, you know, the difference, you know, clarify, or did you consider that? I wish I can consider that. So what I mean is, uh, according to current data set, that's very difficult. To do so, what I think I have to rely on the case studies to do that, which I plan to do that. And addition to that, some of them are part time and some of them are full time, which is a big difference of inventors' involvement. And for that, probably we can aggregate a new data set to look at, and that's on the list as well. Uh, at this point, we haven't done that. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh. Uh, in your analysis on uh, you know impact onto uh, you know like uh, 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 from uh, you know SBIR or venture capital type uh -huh. of thing, you uh -huh. did uh, you know decomposition uh -huh. of a bio and IT, firm yeah. as uh -huh. well as uh -huh. uh, versus uh, you know, IT uh -huh. out of the total data set. Uh -huh. But uh, I'm afraid I missed maybe missed to hear that uh, you know in case of uh, uh, inventors uh, involvement. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I'm still, you know, have some interest in a dependency. Is there any dependency of, you know, the farms' uh, characteristics like a bio farm versus an uh, IT? So far, you look, uh, you look at like handling, you know, in total. No, but I did this sampling as well. Uh huh. Then I found that this is dominated by characteristic of a biomedical. So there was no mediation effect on IT when I uh, decomposed this In that uh, in relation with, uh, with uh, you know, SBIR or BC or something like that? So the, just uh, So what I explained hmm. is uh, seems to be dominated by characteristic of the bio, biomedical. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, right. Uh, let's talk a little bit more offline, but uh, there was some difference. But uh, in the case of IT, most of them are not significant in many ways. I, I, yeah, if I had interesting result, I was talking today. Um.
Um, could you also talk about the last two, um, like two types of startups that you um, categorized, like the low growth versus the high growth startups? I was wondering if um, instead of being mutually exclusive, could they be like, um, for example, the low growth startup, could that be like a stage to becoming high growth startup? Would there be like something like that? So according to my analysis, the longer firm survives, less likely to succeed, which means they are not substitute, I think. I mean, not, not by stage, but totally different characteristics by nature, I think, as far as my data explains. And did, did I answer your question? Maybe not. You are not convinced, I can say. <laughs> Could you give a little bit more background, for example, like an example of two companies? Uh, are different? Yeah. So, so, so some of the university-based startups, they are uh, uh, started by professors of universities. And the incentive for those professors are to get the new research grant outside of university because of the like, NIH grant inside of university is too competitive to receive the grant. So their goal, incentive, is to find a new source of research budget. That often happens in a low girls farm. Did I answer to your question? And uh, for, the, for the high girls startup, that's more like a traditional, what we believe university startup is about right now, I think. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So in my experience, the low growth SBIR startups uh -huh. are ones that tried to be high growth startups and failed. Uh -huh. They were unable to get VC funding and therefore they have decided to survive on SBIR funding. They didn't necessarily start thinking, oh, I'm going to be a low growth startup from day one. They're sort of a failed state. Uh -huh. um, and I think you're quite right. They very rarely become superstars. Uh -huh. Once, once uh -huh. they're there, uh -huh. they're in a new category and they're stuck there for a very long time. I think your observation of grow fast, grow quickly, um, or uh -huh. you just get stuck, I think that's probably true. I, I, see. I think you. your data matches the reality out there. Uh -huh. Thank you. So your point is there are two types of low growth startups. One is what I explained, I explained, and the other is they tried to be high growth, but they failed. I think okay. that's most of them. I see. And th that's also interesting too. To to uh, check, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Yes. Well, you know, you have a big enough uh, database for both uh, bio and uh, IT startup. Uh -huh. Have you tried this approach uh, in the in separating these two groups? And because uh, they have a different, totally different characteristic in terms of their product development cycle and the life cycle and time to market all this, and uh, have you tried to? Yes, so did I did. I did do you get the same result? So I did this subsampling. Maybe I didn't explain very well, but I did subsampling for IT and biomedical. And uh, I explained the mediation test part, which the mediation test only can be supported for uh, biomedical, not for IT. So that's a difference of characteristics. However, as you said, yeah, let's say I did compare the. Uh, like a sub, uh, survival rate and survival year by industry and those kind of uh, basic statistics as well. But I didn't find anything that much interesting, so I didn't report today. But if you have a particular questions, I'm happy to answer. But I did do that. Yes. I was uh, thinking about implication to Japanese uh, university startups. Ah, that's, yes. I, I, I understand that maybe Five ten years ago, uh, government uh, solicited uh, one thousand university startup companies uh -huh. to come up, uh -huh. and I actually understand it two thousand came up. Yes, but not all of most of maybe ninety nine percent of them are low growth. Nothing happening. I think so too. So I really like you to think about any suggestions to how to make a high growth startups in Japan. People are thinking about low growth only. <laughs> that is a very, very important invention for you. I really rely on you, if you could. Right. <laughs> That's in a very tough question that I should be answering, <laughs> and which, yeah, which is important. And 
actually, I, I, yeah, I, I'm still thinking about that actually for a long time. And probably a few answers for the one is probably SBL funding is not necessary in Japan because that doesn't. Funding that. Right. And you know, the government has been trying to yeah, imitate SBIR funding in Japan as well, which I think as a result, it's got worse. <laughs> so that's one. So yeah, that's one. The other is, so you know, government is trying to uh, profess us to also become entrepreneurs in somehow. I mean, you know, they encourage uh, as a policy. But probably what we, we found here is Less inventors' involvement is better, probably, for the, uh, for the successful exit. And especially for the second half of the uh, startups, inventor does not uh, necessary. That means like a sabbatical or you know, for like a dealing with a conflict of commitment and conflict of interest, uh, interest, mm, yeah, interest issues in the universities. Probably university does not have to encourage professors to be entrepreneur that much. And that's maybe other policy implication. I, I know this is not convincing enough, but I'm still trying. <laughs> and I it's always welcome to listen to your suggestions for this, because this is particularly important. Do you have a data for the uh, management? Uh, people in management, not only the inventor uh, becoming a, a management team. So, the so I have the, all of the uh, data of the uh, founders, which is uh, nearly equal to the management team in the beginning. But I don't have the data for the turnover of the uh, founders, which is very tough to aggregate. Um, have you interviewed Bill Miller? No. So Bill Miller <laughs> okay. used to be the, the provost here. Yes, and he I, I know him, yeah. He, oh. he probably has more firsthand knowledge mm. of this ecosystem. Uh -huh. And I think he could give you some hypotheses wow, to, to test because he really, he, he, he knew dozens of these people. And I've had a chance to talk with him a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And he... I think would agree with everything that you've said, or most everything. He would disagree, I think, mm -hmm. on the importance of the university's support um, for the professors and the students being um, uh, involved. And I think he would have counterexamples and a way to perhaps explain the data that would be helpful I to see. you. Thank you very much and for that advice. You know, that, that whole generation isn't going to be around much longer, so uh -huh. you should capture them um, before they're all, you know, who, who, who are alive today and saw the entire valley unfold and knew all the founders right from the get-go. So uh -huh. I would interview them and, and get a little bit of their story while you can in the next year or two. Okay, thank you very much for your advice. Any, I think we are running out of the time, I guess. So we should close. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much.